Welcome to the world premiere of Interfaith Interludes. This is extremely exciting because, uh, well, not only because this is the very first episode, but also our guest today is someone whose work I've admired for over two decades. He's an award-winning actor, writer, producer, consultant, director. His IMDb credits will blow your mind. Uh, you might have seen him in Tromeo and Juliet, Waiting, or Margarita Happy Hour. He's also the chief revenue officer at Koi, a talent-focused startup. He's one of the few American producers to work extensively in Bollywood. He's a professional stuntman. He spent seven years in an ashram. He does Sunday sermons. And this is one of my all-time favorite factoids. He's the founder of St. Babs, making him the first person in known history to have founded and named a church to honor the legacy of his mother. Will Keenan, welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, I gotta tell you, since I, uh, you know, I guess now many years ago, since I became more behind the scenes than on camera, I actually pay much less, less attention to the IMDb's of the world. And I mean, there's this thing, especially, you know, even in business as an executive now, you know, self-branding, you have to put yourself out there a certain way, but I now do things for others, what I used to essentially do for myself, you know, get myself as lead of, you know, some movie or get the press and, uh, you know, uh, update the IMDb and so forth. But uh, that was, that was great. Um, everything and everything I do now that I, I'm a father for the first time, I'm always thinking in terms of when I'm gone, will she like, will Owen like this, my daughter? I'm like, oh, oh yeah, she'll like that, she'll like that. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I first encountered your work kind of randomly. I think I was just flipping through cable stations one night, and one of the most bizarre, <laughs> inventive, and hilarious things came on. It's this unforgettable film called Terror Firmer. Mm. You had the lead role as a character with many twists, yeah. and you were also one of the producers. Um, I should yeah. also mention, anyone who hasn't seen it should at least YouTube the continuity scene. Um, it's very <laughs> unique, it's very meta, and yeah, it's only yeah. like half a minute long. But what I didn't realize when I first saw Terra Firmer was that it's directed by Lloyd Kaufman, who, you know, he was not only one of the cinematographers of the original Rocky movie, but I have come to think of him as being sort of to Generation X, what Roger Corman might have been to the baby boomers. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's like, he, he's this expert in filmmaking technique, but he chose yeah. to forego commercial productions in order to do more like edgy underground cult movies. A lot of people mm -hmm. might know him from Toxic Avenger or Tromeo and Juliet, where you played yeah. Tromeo. So how did yeah. you first connect with Lloyd Kaufman? Well, it's, uh, so I went to New York University, right? And uh, from South Jersey, I, and I had an option, uh, I did really well in high school, and I had an option to either go to the Air Force Academy, uh, and that's where, it's, you know, that was going to be my future. And then, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I was always acting, I call it. Uh, and it was like, it's my last chance to, to even decide if it's something I would want to do. And I said, all right, you know, if I get into the top school at the time, NYU, undergrad drama, and they give me a pile of money to go, <laughs> then I'll, I'll at least consider it as an option. So what you know, that exactly happened. They gave me early decision. They gave me all this money. And then, uh, you know, my whole high school and all the guidance counselors, they were so mad because I would have been the first to graduate and then go to the Air Force Academy. <clears throat> so, and it was amazing. Like, you know, I'm from kind of, you know, although born in Philly and, uh, you know, hung out there a lot growing up. I'm from South Jersey, more, more kind of, you know, suburban. Uh, so New York City was amazing. And I was 16 and a half. I was always young for my grades. So when I started going there, and it was just, you know, it was it was incredible. But to get my money's worth, even though I was getting all this financial aid, I double majored and double minored. So it was like drama uh, or theater as uh, and psychology and then philosophy and dance. Ooh. And it was, you know, during that time where uh, I fell in love with performance art, kind of experimental theater. And I was and I was doing Shakespeare, I really took Shakespeare seriously. And then towards the end, uh, right when we were about to graduate, I'd say to myself, you know what? I don't care if I'm in debt for the rest of my life, paying off my student loans. I was fulfilled in 99 seat black box theaters, doing some really weird stuff, mind you. Maybe not as weird as the trauma stuff, but there was, there was, there was kind of a smooth transition from performance art, dance, avant-garde theater to like cult cinema like trauma was making. And it was the week before we were, we were graduating uh, many years ago. 
And me and my buddies were sitting around uh, my apartment on St. Mark's Place uh, in the East Village. And everyone's kind of like wondering what we're going to do after graduation, you know. And someone had a backstage uh, paper there, which is, you know, it's now online. It's for casting and stuff. Uh, and they're like, oh, my God, you know, Troma's casting Tromeo and Juliet. And I was the only, it was like four of us. I was the only one who was just like, what's Troma? I'd never seen a Troma movie, anything. But it intrigued me. And we were all going to go audition. And uh, it said that there was, you know, it was based on Shakespeare. And I, I'm not sure if in the original ad, it may have said like there was going to be real iambic pentameter, Shakespeare's, you know, uh, the, the language. And so I went down and uh, and I auditioned and they immediately, you know, started, you know, kind of, uh, I was then reading with Jane Jensen, who was, who ended up being Juliet. I could tell I, I was going to get hired, but reading the whole script, I was like, oh my God what the oh what oh like wh while my friends were watching these movies when they were younger i was you know more of uh climbing trees and stuff so i had no idea but i said to myself this this is probably gonna be the only chance i have to do actual shakespeare on film you know and it it was uh so there were some actual lines from you know the play sure. uh, romeo and juliet and the rest of the whole script was written in iambic pentameter by Mr. James Gunn, who, you know, was essentially co-director at the time. Lloyd, you know, uh, usually brings on a right hand, like a James for Tromeo and Juliet. Uh, and I was that person for Terror Firmer. So Ooh. after after Tromeo and Juliet, you know, I was then kind of, you know, I caught the film bug, to be honest, uh, because when I saw myself on screen the first time at in Cannes at the, the market where they, uh, you know, where we premiered Tromeo, I, you know, theater acting is very different from film acting, which is very different from TV acting, which is also very different from YouTube acting. You know, YouTube and, and Chroma are kind of, you know, you have to be really big for this small screen, you know? Right. Uh, but, on, but on TV, and I found this out later when I played the, uh, you know, the fake white Michael Jackson in, in Law and Order's SVU, I didn't like my, I rarely like any of my performances. This, you know, I'll just get that out there. I'm very critical. Most, most you know, on-camera people are. Some of them can't even look at themselves. But uh, I kind of got into that world and, and, you know, starting, you know, starring in your first movie right out of college, you know, we shot that summer, uh, but being branded as Tromeo, you know, I definitely, it was almost like a porn career, you know, it opened up, it, it opened up some doors, but it slammed other ones shut, you know, Interesting. Uh, but having caught the film bug by then, uh, I was also, I remember on, on Tromeo, I was just so intrigued with what was going on with the camera and with James and, and Lloyd. So I was watching, watching, watching. And I really caught the bug because it was right after that I, I shot my first uh, short film, which was called Hoof Boy. Uh, you know, because although, you know, I'm an actor, I'm a Virgo, and I'm not a control freak, but, you know, I learned very early on actors are, uh, you know, we're not taken seriously. Everyone thinks we're lying unless the camera's on when we're supposed to be lying. Uh, we're the last to know anything on the set. You know, it's like actors are treated a certain way, and I, in some cases for good reason. So I caught I caught that bug. Um, but then I guess it was just a year, year and a half later, Lloyd was doing his next one. Like he used to do a movie like almost every two years or something. Uh, and he sent me the script and he wanted me to play the other character, other male lead, Jerry, who's the big trauma, uh, you know, freak and, and all about the kind of trauma movies. Cause it, like you said, it's very meta. It's kind of like self referential. Uh, you know, everyone used to always ask us, what's it like working on a trauma movie? I was like, it's like going to war. It's like, you know, so that movie terror firmer, you know, is pretty true to form of what it's like being on a trauma movie, but the, the accompanying documentary farts of darkness that really it's all behind the scenes footage hours and hours and hours and you see how uh you know, that's why most people never go back for a second trauma movie i i did because when lloyd uh handed me the script i had said to him all right look i'll do this under a few conditions i thought i had some leverage uh i said i don't want to play that character i want to play this other character the villain but i want to I want to regender it. Uh, I, I want it to be a hermaphrodite. And he was like, what? What are you talking about? That's crazy. Da, da, da. And I had taken this women's studies class in NYU and uh, herma you know, hermaphrodites were a part of it. And I, I was just blown away by the stats of, of hermaphrodites, how many are born, how many are corrected, this and that. 
and like how they're revered in other cultures and so forth. But in the West, it's kind of like, you know, and there's four different kinds. There's true merm, merm, merm aphrodite, true merm, firm, firm aphrodite, and true firm. Uh, and some two lean more towards the male, two lean more towards the female, but only one on either side can actually uh, procreate, reproduce. So no matter which one you lean towards in the Western world, if you, you know, if, if a hermaphrodite is born, uh, and I think it's still to this day that the parents are then saying, hey, hey, uh, uh, do you want it to be a boy or a girl? And depending on what they want, is is it's corrected you know so it could could be a mermaphrodite which leans more towards male but in our culture uh you know western medical society they immediately quote unquote correct it you know they did a study many many years ago of like you know ten thousand hermaphrodites in france and you know which were not corrected you know they don't do that in europe um mm -hmm. and they loved their life because they could they were fluid they could kind of you know and to me it's it's like uh, it's like filling the void. If we didn't correct hermaphrodites in the Western world, would we have a lot of the things that you know are happening today with people, you know, very, very kind of uh, you know concerned about gender fluidity and so forth, you know, and about what's natural. Like in, in Native American culture, the First Nations here, they revere it. It's like a gift from uh, the Great Spirit because here's right. someone you can do both the hunting and the gathering. So anyway, so I said that, and I said I want to be a producer. You know, I want to learn more about it, and I want to be essentially the James Gunn. So I was the casting director. I was I was the producer. I rehearsed all the actors. I staged all the action, uh, and that's how. And Lloyd, we would you know send him tapes every day during the development and pre-production process. And then he shows up to the set, screams and yells, and uh, the pizza guy delivers pizza, and he lets him direct a scene. It's crazy. It's wow. nuts. But you learn so much. Like I always said, and he, you know, Troma Lloyd ends up hiring a lot of first timers in key you know, department head positions uh, because it's really, really tough job. No one is going to do it twice. I was, I think it was the only person who went back and, and at least did, you know, starred twice, but then took on some other, other roles. Uh, and I used to say, <clears throat> you know, and I am somewhat proud of that performance. You know, Lloyd, Lloyd always says, and I know it's part of his, you know, uh, his, his grassroots publicity shtick, but you know, if, if it were just world, Will, Will Keenan would have been given an Oscar for that. Uh, you know, so I am somewhat proud of that performance. Uh, and I used to say it was, you know, cinema's first hermaphrodite serial killer, which is true. But nowadays, having taken kind of a, you know, a tip from Lloyd about how to spin things, it's, uh, you know, now I'm saying it's the first trans serial killer. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's that's how that happened. Yeah, you even got to murder somebody with a bong, which I feel like is the got to be a first in that was, cinema history. That was in the script, and that was you know the the big death scenes like that, the bong, the in that movie, the um, the escalator, like they're the hardest to shoot, take the longest. I mean, days and days. Uh, everything else, <laughs> you know, you get pretty much one take. You know, only the leads uh, could ask for a second take if we wanted it. Uh, which which I got, but only like two or three tops, um, and you know it's a trauma movie. So uh, you know people would quit all the time, all the time, like every day, even actors, right? And there have been trauma movies, and I think, yeah, in one of the movies it may have been Terra Firma, but definitely Tromeo. You'll see a, a kind of a supporting character or a minor character, you know, come on once or twice, same name, and then it's played by someone completely different. You know from one scene to the next because they quit earlier that day wow. and you know you just put them in the costume and you, you act like nothing happened uh, or they put a melon in its place you know and and kill and kill that character off uh the only you know people uh, if you watch farts of darkness you really see what it's like because it is it is like going to war there's money you know a lot of first timers um you know safety's first on a trauma set because of all these weird things going on um but you know, and Lloyd screams and yells a lot. You know, one of the reasons why people quit, you know, mm. uh, it's very, very high pressure environment. You're not getting paid anything, you know, if it, it you know, maybe a little bit. I remember, I, I think I made $300 as Chromeo and never wow. saw another, and never saw another dime. I may have made like $600 on, uh, on Terra Firma. And I made sure, because I was the casting director as well, I made sure everyone got paid. Um, you know, it wasn't much, but, you know, they weren't planning on paying anybody. You know, trauma has a fan base. People just, you know, they'll just show up to be in the movie, to be a PA on the movie. 
you know, but it's, it's, you know, I, I like to say whatever you did on a trauma movie, uh, you know, head of, uh, you know, production designer or something like that, you know, even if you've never done it before, you're pretty much an expert by the end of it. Wow. Know, that's why, that's why you'll never go back. It's a really, really good training ground. Uh, but the leads, the lead actors are the only ones, uh, that Lloyd doesn't yell at. And that's because if you've shot with your leads and they quit, then you actually have to reshoot and that costs money. And you know, that is not trauma. Interesting. <laughs> so how did you go from that to starting a church or was it the other way around? Maybe a little bit. So I, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, in this area, Philadelphia and South Jersey, Catholic. Went to twelve years of Catholic school, or as I like to say, I was in for twelve years. <laughs> and although uh, that kind of pushed me away from, uh, you know, anything divine, let's say, you know, some bad experiences there. When I went to NYU, and I, I, I really, you know, kind of um, credit my mother with this. Uh, she always kind of instilled that faith in me. Just put it in God's hands, Billy. You know, so she was she was a believer, and she wasn't like you know a strict Catholic or anything. But uh, she was the eldest of uh, seven. Uh, she had six younger brothers and uh, five younger brothers and one sister. Uh, and they grew up in Philadelphia, not wealthy or anything. So you know, she had it she had it rough. And her belief in God uh, was definitely you know passed on to myself and my sisters. So I had it in there. And it was, you know, kind of like Catholic church and Catholic school uh, that, you know, kind of turned me off to, you know, dogma, let's say. But when I went to NYU, it was mainly the booksellers in the East Village and so forth, because I would be going to class and I, I was always a reader and I'd be looking at, you know, these books and I'd see the Upanishads or, you know, the Zohar, or I would see all these sacred texts and I would buy them. You know, and I'd be like, this is going to, you know, I just, my intuition was this is going to come in handy later, you know? And then I just started, uh, you know, collecting these books and I had a really nice, by the time, you know, I was graduating, I had a really nice library and I started to dip into the books. Um, I taught myself meditation. I kind of, you know, I should probably, you know, I could probably have a, uh, a degree in comparative religion because I studied all the religions and you know, all the major religions and some not so major and all each one also has its mystical branch, you know, so Ooh. with Judaism, it's Kabbalah uh, for, for Hinduism, it's the yogis or Islam. They say it's the Sufis for Christians. It's the contemplatives or the Gnostics, you know, Ooh. and what I, what I realized is that all the mystical branches are, are pretty much saying the same thing, many paths, you know, to the same place. I mean, Kabbalah has yoga postures and breathing exercises, you know, I mean, even Jesus, right. In the new Testament, uh, you know, I, he, I, I believe he definitely alludes to, uh, more kind of secret, deeper teachings, the masses he taught in parables, but for his disciples, you know, he, he taught in other ways. And I think that was, you know, I mean, at least a lot of people say it's from, you know, having a close knit and they would do these intense, maybe some was based in Kabbalah. You know, he was Jewish, right? Uh, these intense spiritual practices. So when he says something like, you know, um, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Now, to, you know, to someone who hasn't studied, you know, what the, is it in, I, I'll never pronounce it right, the Kutestra Katanya in Hinduism, uh, the spiritual third eye, you know, your spiritual eye, between your eyebrows, uh, you know, some people I, I respect and have done a lot of this kind of, you know, academic research say that all the pictures you see of Christian saints looking up into the heavens, no, they're actually looking up into their own third eye. Uh, because if you concentrate there um, enough and, you know, at least, you know, relax or go through some breathing techniques or, you know, even a mantra uh, that, you know, it raises your consciousness, you start to feel at peace, that still small voice, you know, that, you know, you probably heard when you were little, but then kind of, you know, culture beat it out of you. Uh, you know, I, I like to say that, uh, you know, it, it's like the voice that told me to get to my mother and the church. <laughs> uh, when I was in LA and I'd, you know, been an executive for a while, did really, really well, but I was burnt out and I wanted to take a six month true sabbatical and I truly just wanted to stand on my head, you know, for about six months and, you know, pay someone to deliver me, you know, vegetables and fruits and, you know, some grains and stuff. Uh, and I got, you know, because of my career and I've gotten to travel the world with movies and so forth, 
I had all these great offers to do it in India, to do it in Greece, to do it in Italy. And I was really excited about it. And I, uh, I had this still, after a meditation, I had this still small voice tell me, if you do that, when you come back, your mom will no longer be in her body. And I knew my mother had been sick. She was a, you know, a career nurse, uh, OBGYN, a baby nurse uh, at Cooper Hospital uh, in Camden, New Jersey. And, she, you know, nurses and doctors, like, you know, they hear you sniffling in the other room. They'll break the door down just to try, you know, try to heal you. Uh, but with themselves, you know, don't worry about me, nothing. They never do anything for themselves. So I knew she was sick, uh, you know, certain cancers run in my family. Uh, and, she, you know, she would come out to visit, you know, at least twice a year in L.A. And I would come back for major holidays. And as an executive, I was uh, going to New York on business a lot. And I would always go down and see her and my family, my sisters. Uh, and it just became obvious that she was, you know, getting sick, sicker and sicker. But none of us could get anything out of her, the truth out of her and so forth and so on. So I called it with like, once this, I had this intuition, this wise voice, you know, it's, it's, it's your, once you, you know, especially through meditation, you know, I used to do, meditate all day long with certain techniques and, uh, you know, the experiences you, I, I can't, I, I can't, I still can't put them into words. Like I could, but it still doesn't do it justice, you know? Uh, and then that piece that comes along and then this, voice this intuition it's your own voice it's my own voice but it's just much wiser and more calm and more you know uh just genuine than how i'm speaking right now yeah 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 Yeah. the higher self exactly so i called my mom right after that and i said mom uh, do you mind if i take my six month sabbatical in my old room in your condo and she was like yeah okay billy yeah uh you know i'd lived there you know i'd left when i was 16 years old and, you know, I came back to do that and I realized she was much worse off because I hadn't seen her in a while. All of a sudden she's not uh, accepting the plane tickets, you know, twice a year to LA. Uh, and she tells me it's because she's afraid of flying now, you know? So it was anything to deflect us worrying about her, you know, even lying, right? I was like, mom, what do you mean you're afraid of flying? You've, you've done it like hundreds of times. And then, I still didn't know that she was kind of just, you know, making excuses. But then I, you know, I, I was doing some research and it was right around the same time. And she even used, there was a plane, I don't know if it was French or German. It just kind of smashed into a, a, a mountain or something. Huh. And she was kind of using that. So I did some research and you found out like, you know, if a plane falls from the sky, there comes a point long before you hit the ground you know, because of the air, oxygen or whatever, you, you, get, you pass out. So essentially you're asleep if you die in a plane crash. I told her that. And, uh, and she said, fine, she would, but I ended up coming back before that. And what I came back to was I thought I would have, you know, I thought I'd do my sabbatical, stand on my head in my room when I, you know, when I was a teenager and take care of my sick mother for six months. Uh, I thought I had six months. I had six days before she, before she passed. My sisters who live in the area say she, you know, she waited for you to come home. Wow. You know? So it was a shock and it was kind of a shock how she went. So cancer had been building up in her, in her body for like nine years. Uh, and she was like kind of fooling everybody. My sisters who lived only a few miles from her, she wasn't answering the door, not answering calls. You know, when I got there, there was a certain kind of smell, you know, in the place. Uh, I hugged her and I don't, I don't know if we should get into all this, especially because some of it's visual, but I hugged her and it was just like this huge thing uh, on her chest, found out later. It was a 36 double D bra, which one cup she was using to hold the tumor that was wow. on her chest, which I saw at the hospital when they peeled it off. And the tumor itself looked like an alien coming out of her chest with all, you know, with all sorts of different colors and, and stuff. So she had been hiding this for a while and the nurse, as she is, like doing nothing, not even putting ointment on it. She was using a 36 double D bra. She was a, a petite woman. Uh, to hold this tumor and in her bathroom, she was using like maxi pads as bandages with no, I mean, here's a nurse, right? Career nurse. Wow. So when that happened, um, you know, I stayed in the condo. I was going through the morning, you know, I was mourning the process and rather than like, you know, cut my sabbatical short or go back to LA, uh, I decided to stay mourn, uh, you know, kind of tidy up her affairs in this condo where I was living. 
and uh, reconnect with some family and friends. But, you know, so I was in that condo for like three or four months and I put myself through, you know, uh, and I guess because of my history as an actor and, and you know, being, uh, you know, liking, like wanting to explore things, mm -hmm. I was just going through certain exercises where I was trying to simply imagine what, what it was like for the past number of years, her walking around doing things. And it was, it was somewhat morbid. I gotta, I gotta say, I'm glad I went through it, but it was somewhat morbid. Um, and I started, you know, so we're about an hour, uh, you know, about 15 minutes from Philly and about an hour north of the Jersey Cape, the southern tip of New Jersey, where we always used to vacation when I was a kid. And I have blood relatives down there. So I started taking trips down there to reconnect with relatives. And I got tired of taking the Atlantic City Expressway and the Guard State Parkway. And I was taking the back roads. And one day I was uh, driving by one of these old, like, you know, in, in rural New Jersey, uh, and this is closer to the Delaware Riverside down there. It's farmland. It's, it's why they call it the Garden State, you know? And I see this really old, cool-looking church for sale. And the spirit moved me. I just kind of pulled over. And, you know, there's not much around. And it's, you know, it's this old historic building, church building. It looks like it had been closed for a while. And it has this cemetery around it, about two acres worth. And I was walking around the cemetery, and people were born in the 1700s, buried there. And all the famous names that kind of founded Cape May County are all buried there. And I said to myself, uh, you know, I looked at the for sale sign and I said, all right, I, if the real, I'm going to call. If the real estate agent either picks up or they call me back in like five minutes, then, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> and I was just surprised. They called back five minutes later like, oh, my God, you're there? I'll be right over. I'll be right over. Because they <laughs> been try they've been trying to sell the place for like six or ten years. Wow. So um, from the outside it looked, you know, needed, it looked like it was falling into disrepair, but the inside, and it was a Methodist church from 1896, right? The inside looked pristine and it was like original wood, wood you know, ceiling, floor, everything. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and on the way out, I, I made an offer and I said, it's good. It's good for three days. And, uh, and then that's how it all happened. So I, one of the things I've realized or found out going through my mom's stuff after she passed was that she very well could have gone on to become a doctor and, you know, uh, doctors revered her. Uh, one of them even got in touch with me after, uh, they couldn't make it to their funeral cause they were then in California and they said she was then mother Teresa of nursing right. at this place. You know, it didn't matter who you were. She all, you know, she always made them feel loved. And, you know, I mean, in Camden, New Jersey, you had a lot, she was taking care of you know, a lot of people. Uh, you know, there was homeless people, there were people, you know, who were having mental issues, drug issues and so forth. And, uh, and the doctors revered her. So, but I realized through her paperwork that she very well could have gone on to become a doctor, but she put as a single parent, myself and my sisters through college. So I said to myself, I want to keep her legacy going. I had saved up some money uh, and I want to start a foundation, technically a church in, in her name. Didn't realize it was like, you know, making history. No one's ever named a church after their own dead mother before. Uh, but to get, kind of give back to that community, uh, which we did, you know, for a number of years, like we've uh, provided emergency shelter to hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, brought, brought, you know, uh, a lot of money to the local economy. Uh, hired a lot of people or and or placed them, you know, with employment, uh, gave lots of kids and families, underprivileged families, computer equipment, music equipment. You know, we were getting grants from, you know, the local governments and, and uh, chains like Wawa. So, you know, I, uh, I don't know what else to say other than like, that's, that's what I did for a long time. And I was totally happy. I, I got to be honest, like I've had some really challenging gigs in my career. Like try, try to get Shirley McLean out of her trailer. Okay. <laughs> I was the only one who could do it uh, or try to get money back from little Wayne. But, uh, uh -huh. but running this church, uh, you know, with, with, you know, my last job before that I had a staff of 40 people and I had like three assistants, you know? So, uh, you know, a few volunteers started, but it was a lot of work and it was the most challenging gig. I've ever had, uh, but also the most fulfilling, you know, because it was like, you're, you're there. You can tell you're making a difference with, with, with people like one on one, 
you know? Um, and, uh, and, but I did not expect to uh, get into a relationship and fall in love. Like I was pretty much set on being a monk, you know, uh, and giving my, you know, giving my life to this uh, organization that I started in, in honor of my mother, uh, but giving my, my life to God and just trying to help people. Um, and it's kind of what I always wanted to do. I, you know, what, after my first year in professional entertainment industry, you know, <laughs> Romeo, uh, and then seeing what the industry was really like, quickly I realized uh, what was going on. And, <clears throat> and I'd be crazy to, you know, to say that I didn't want my work to get to a larger audience, but here I was becoming king of the bees, you know, uh, and doing and doing work that I, I was really unsure of. I would go to these conventions and stuff, and these young people, all tatted up and you know piercings. Nothing wrong with that, but you know track marks on their arms, and coming up to me were like, "Your movie Romeo changed my life," and you know, because because I do believe such images, such extreme images, especially on a developing brain, uh, has has an effect. I mean, I cut out. You know, TV, and I, I didn't see films for many years, and I was making them uh, mainly because you know I used to use the excuse that I I wanted all my stuff to be original. I didn't want to take anything from anywhere. Uh, but when I would, you know, I'd see a movie or or some kind of con TV or some kind of content for the first time in like eight months, and then those images would stick with me. I mean, I'd, I'd be having dreams or nightmares about them, so forth. So I, I was really, really under uh, like you know this 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 battle in myself. I was like, I, I really didn't uh, approve of the work I was doing. I thought it was actually doing bad in the world, you know. And it was a monk at the ashram I lived at, and we'll get to that, <laughs> uh, who I talked to, and is a self-realization fellowship. Paramahansa Yogananda, he's considered father of yoga in the West. He wrote autobiography of a yogi. Right. You know, uh, George Harrison, uh, you know, devo devoted all the proceeds from My Sweet Lord, the reissue of My Sweet Lord to that organization. Uh, really good stuff. And, and me having read so much and felt like I should have a comparative degree in religion and like I was building my own kind of toolbox, you know. Uh, but what I found after uh, coming across Yogananda was that, you know, you can build your own toolbox, but, you know, it's like trying to cross a river with uh, one foot in two different boats, you know, you're going to fall in the middle. Ooh. So he was the only uh, saint, you know, or spiritual figure. And I've read, he has a canon of stuff, not as much as Buddha, but a lot of what, a lot of what is attributed to Buddha is not right. Ooh. This is all Yogananda's and I read everything and I could not disagree with one thing. And it's a science of, of spirituality. So there are these techniques that you do and either, you know, they work or they don't. And they really, really worked for me. Uh, wait, where was I going with you? Oh, well, you know, sorry, that, man, I went all over the place. I'm sorry. No, that's the beauty of it. Um, so uh, did you want to talk about sort of um, your time in the ashram? Yeah. Okay. So after Terra Firmer, uh, I did fall in love and, uh, and then 9 11 happened. And I watched it from my roof in Williamsburg. Whoa. And it, it had a, a major, major effect on everyone I know myself included, you know, I watched, you know, the towers go down and then, you know, I was right, uh, had this, this big loft right in Williamsburg, right where the, the bridge is there, you know, and like, uh, it's elevated and, you know, the, the JZM line, I used to call it the JZM line, uh, subway used to be like 12 feet out my window. So I went on the roof and watched it. And within an hour or two, because all the subways were shut down, everything was shut down. I just see this mass of what looked like zombies crossing the bridge to go home and they're just covered in soot and moving really slowly it was it was like you know a zombie movie and then the whole you know the whole city uh i mean the whole world was so affected by that but the city just got crazy people were just you know i mean i walked downstairs like two days later i see someone get thrown into a, a storefront through the glass and it was insane so uh my girlfriend and i at the time uh, we decided to move to LA, uh, but I should backtrack before that I was, uh, going to retire from the industry and 
And I remember telling my mother this, and I was going to become a monk, and I was going to go out to the Himalayas, the Himalayan mountains. Um, and I was really dead set on doing that. But I fell in love. And, and it's, it's kind of like what they say a 9-11 relationship was, because this girl I was in love with, who appears in Terror Firmer, by the way, um, and I did not know she liked me at all. But anyway, once that happened, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, once 9-11 happened, it put into question your life, your career, your relationship. You know, people broke up because their life's too short. You know, they broke up. If they were unhappy in a relationship, people got together. And I just remember, I don't know how, I think it was like three days after, the subway still wasn't running. I just started walking across the bridge to go to this girl who lived uh, on the Lower East Side, like probably 15 or so blocks, you know, from the end of the bridge on the Manhattan side. And who did I meet in the middle of the bridge walking towards me was this girl. So that was kind of it. We fell in love and, and then I'm kind of like torn between uh, what I wanted to do, you know? And, and I remember I was talking to my mother. She's like, put it in God's hands, Billy. So anyway, uh, we move out to LA and we can't find a place to live. This is like the first few days there. I have a friend there who says, oh, you know, it's LA. We have an extra room. Take your time. Even six months, just, you know, you can take your time, look for a place. Da, da, da. But after three days, they were already giving us, you know, the kind of like, eh, you guys got to <laughs> But I had uh, bad credit at the time. Uh, my then uh, wife, uh, had no credit. She's European and she hadn't established any credit here. So we were getting turned down from like, you know, shoe box bachelor pads and we had, and we didn't have much money that we had enough, but we were just getting turned down. And then, uh, and I just picked up a, a rinky dink motorcycle just so we could tool around and look for places. And I just remember driving down sunset Ave, uh, on the East side, uh, you know, East Hollywood area. And I see this great golden Lotus leaf and I'm like, I know that, what is that? And it was from the picture in the back of Autobiography of Yogi, the Yogananda book. Yeah. And I was just like, you know what, I'm, I'm pulling in here. So we pulled in and I'm like, wow, this is it. You know, because I was really into Yogananda at the time. And I was like, this is amazing. And, you know, they're, that property, which has been around for a long, long time, takes up like half the block. And beyond the temple, it's like beautiful, you know, uh, you know, waterfalls and, and meditation benches and flowers, just gorgeous, right in the middle of like, you know, Hollywood, East Hollywood. And then start walking in the back and we see these little cottages and it looks like people live there. So on the way out, I go to the bookstore area and there's this elderly woman who, and she's like, you know, a volunteer. I was like, hey, t tell me about the, uh, looks like there's apartments back there. We're looking for apartments. She's like, oh no, that's only for the monastics and oh, Kriya bonds, people who are initiated into Kriya Yoga, uh, you know, the, the discipline that Yogananda, Sri Yukteswar, Mahavatar Babaji, it's a certain, you know, uh, Raha Royal Yoga. Um, and people who've been studying it for two years who get initiated. And I'm like, oh, okay. But again, the intuition, the little voice said, persist. So I called up uh, the headquarters, which is in Mount Washington. And I just left this message. And I don't really remember what I said, except, you know, that, hey, my wife and I, like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know I'm, I've been studying Yogananda and, uh, you know, we really need a place. And so I get a, I get a call back from the guy. There was, it, was, it was a guy, he was not a monastic. He was like an administrator. And, uh, and I, I guess I just, you know, said my piece to him. I don't remember what I said because he, he called us back like an hour later and he said, some of and this is not me. Like, I feel like just, I was in the zone the des the white hot desire was there and the intention behind it was pure. Right. But he said, this is a quote. He said, some of the words you said were like divine mother speaking herself. He's like, if you meet the property manager there who's also not a part of it, just more of a, you know, a vendor. And you have, I think it was $1,500. You can move right in. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, and then we moved into an apartment in an ashram of self-realization fellowship. And that first month, especially I was so, because we weren't two years initiated into Kriya yoga, we weren't already a part of that community. I was so afraid of like being found out and uh, like, they're, they're not supposed to be here. 
you know, so I would be walking around with like a white sheet on my head and saying, God bless, God bless to everybody, you know, and I probably made myself stand out even more, you know, but then, but then being there for a little while, you realize, oh no, these, these are, these are normal people. They just have a, a certain discipline. They try to meditate and they follow Yogananda's teachings. And then I became an usher, you know, I became, uh, I used to teach the energization exercises. I got really involved uh, there. And at the same time, I'm still doing this Hollywood career. Uh, this is when I got, you know, played the fake white Michael Jackson on Law and Order. And I was, you know, still doing some of the cult indie movies, but I started producing at the same time, again, because I had, you know, I want to do more than just be on camera. So I was producing independent films. So like dealing with Hollywood and agents and all that, you know, all that comes with it during the day. And then being able to, for seven years, be able to walk through those gates into technically an ashram uh, and live that life. Like it's what essentially what kept me, uh, not, I was going to say kept me sane in the industry, but I think, you know, kept, kept me uh, at least, you know, trying to be a good person, let's say, you know, yeah. which is the same thing. I think you asked someone uh, what you emailed me. You know, when I was making those crazy cult movies, you know, back in the mid, late 90s, early 2000s, before I left, especially before I left New York City, I was, even back then, I was having a real problem because I was so good at it, right? Oh. I was so good at playing these sick and twisted characters. And, and everyone's like, oh, only you can do that, Will. And I'm like, why me? And I realized it's because, you know, I think because I was a psych major as well. And with with kind of like a focus on abnormal psychology, I thought it would add a little color to the characters I would play, and it sure did. Um, but I, but I was having a, a real tough time of it. Like I know actors, certain actors who shall remain nameless. Some of them, you know, your audience would know, who never came out of character sometimes because they just, you know, there's the whole process. Even in acting schools, they teach you, you know, how to kind of, you know, de-escalate, you know, how to get out of the character. But every character you play, there's a lot of yourself in it. And also every character you play, especially if it's intense, a lot of it, some of it stays with you, you know, unless you can do a full kind of, you know, clearing of the, of the spirits. Uh, so what helped me back then was uh, based on those books that I had been pulling off, you know, from or, pull, you know, buying from booksellers in college uh, that I had been reading during these times, I started writing and performing like, so I'd, I'd finish, you know, we'd get done at like midnight uh, shooting terror firmer on the waterfront, you know, with me being, you know, just sick and twisted stuff under the guise of comedy. Cool. And then at, you know, 1230 or one, I would walk into a, a coffee shop that was having a open word, you know, open mic spoken word kind of thing. And I would do what I call spiritual rap poetry. And so I have a, a small, you know, book out. I think you can get it on Amazon. It's called The Tao of Will. And those, those are all my, and they, you know, they read as poems, uh, but I used to perform them, uh, you know. And it was a completely kind of different thing, you know. Uh, I'm a broad performer in things like the Tomo movies. And I'm sure when I did my spoken word rap poetry, uh, you, know, you, know, people th you know, people thought I was pretty broad as well, but, it kind of, you know, it was one way besides, you know, because I, I hadn't really started full, fully meditating a lot then. So it was one way for me to kind of reset after doing sick and twisted stuff that I was always, always worried about how it would affect people, you know? Oh, so, oh, this is what I was getting to at the ashram. When I was being offered these crazy roles again, I, I, uh, and I was producing at the same time. I went to a monk and I was like, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what to do about this. It's like, you know, they're offering money and, but I'm, it just, it's, I'm scared, you know, that it's going to affect people. And, and he said to me, he said, you know what Yogananda told, because there were, you know, back in the day when Yogananda was there and his, uh, you know, a lot of entertainment industry types, you know, loved him and, uh, and learned to meditate from him and, you know, took in his talks and stuff. Uh, he, I'm going to tell, and the monk says to me, I'm going to tell you what Yogananda, Yogananda told an actor back then who was worried about the very same thing. And he said, <clears throat> he said, better it's you playing these characters than someone else who's really messed up because the energy, the vibes from the screen uh, are very different when someone like you who, you know, believes in the higher self and tries to be a good person and, and studies certain spiritual, ancient spiritual techniques, you know, better for someone like you to 
be a chameleon and play those characters because uh, if a if if a truly evil person does it, uh, it can have you know much worse impact on the impressionable viewer, which I believe. Wow, yeah, that kind of reminds me of a Wes Craven quote yeah. that was in like one of the later um, Freddy Krueger movies, like Wes Craven's New Nightmare. I think that was my favorite one because it was really meta. But he's in it near the end, and he's got this fascinating monologue, and they're basically harassing him, like, "Why do you keep making these movies? You're terrifying my child. I don't even let him see any of these movies, but he knows about Freddy because of the same way every kid knows about Santa." You know, it's become yeah. part of our lore and mythology. And there's this line about the power of storytelling. And by being in control of the story, you're able to kind of keep that genie in the lamp. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, just, just uh, to let you know, like, I, I, I still don't watch movies, especially the kind of ones I've made, you know, <laughs> uh, at least as an actor. You know, I can't handle horror movies. I, it just sticks with me. It's not that I get scared or anything. It's like, it's just, it, it, I, I guess I'm a sensitive type with, with images. They're very powerful. You know, the other thing um, uh, Yogananda, you know, said and wrote, I, I read it, uh, was that there has to be, you know, for, for this grand show, this great Lila play of life to go on, you know, if it were perfect, right, it'd be heaven on earth. There'd be no reason to have this school of life, you know, that I do believe we have to keep coming back to maybe not earth, but uh, to learn lessons we did not in an incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. But he said, you know, for the, for the show to go on, there has to be a villain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, each generation or each era has its own set of villains. Like, you know, we can right now, and a lot of people will, and I and sometimes I'll join them to, you know, point out certain figures that are alive right now saying they are freaking evil and they should be stopped. Why isn't anyone stopping them? Why are they only, you know, why are they only going after the good people? Blah, blah, blah. But it's just the new version. And it and the show has to keep going on and there has to be a villain, but it has to keep it's the greatest show on earth, right? It has to keep it has to be more interesting than the last version, right? Uh, and that although I am truly concerned about uh, various aspects of life on earth right now, uh, you know, before I think we started recording, we were talking about climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, you still can look, and Yogananda said this too, you know, because whatever you're, you know, he didn't say this, but whatever you're looking for, if you look, if you believe the world is evil and, and you know, you go out there and you're like, I bet you I'm going to meet some evil mofo today, you will, you absolutely will. Uh, but if what you're thinking about is like, no, there's beauty in life and beauty in every, every aspect, even in, you know, uh, some things you wouldn't normally think is beautiful. It depends on what you're, you know, what you think about, you bring about, right? So you'll see beauty in life, but even in a, you know, statisticians, uh, statisticians way you can look. And, uh, I think it was, there was a politician who actually used this the other day. And I was like, wow. And it's that at any point in history, there is less killing going on. There is less human trafficking going on. There is less of all the, you know, the ails uh, throughout human, recorded human history. And there's even more people now, population, right? Ogunan had said like, you know, back in the day, I think it was like 8 million population in LA, surround LA. And uh, yes, you you know, and the, the news sensationalizes the murder that happened or da 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 da. But he says, I'm like, well, isn't it great that there's 8 million and they're not all killing each other? You know, it's only this 0. 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, whatever percent or something. And so it depends on how you, how you look at things, you know? I mean, a lot of people want to, and I do too. And I tried, you know, and I continue to try because uh, you have to, uh, you know, to try to fix the ills of the world. But, you know, and again, not to keep going back to Yogananda, but I do consider him, you know, I'm a chela. Uh, like a guru, you know, uh, as I do, you know, Jesus, you know, in the lineage, uh, there's only, you know, so many people, I think throughout, uh, recorded human history that we know of that did what Jesus did, did what Buddha did, did what Yogananda did. And, and, you know, you know, don't tell me you don't believe in God until you go out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and pray your heart out for an answer you will get an answer, right? So until someone goes through the stuff, it's not an analytical thing. You can't just, it's beyond human comprehension. Uh, you know, I, got, I lost track again. I get excited. I'm sorry. 
No, I love it. Um, and this is part of why I started this show. I want to push back against a lot of these things like, oh, well, why doesn't God just do it? Or, you know, why didn't these prayers get answered? But it's like, you know, it's about the Free human will. condition. It, yeah, that too. God leaves space. I mean, what fun would that be if it was just, you know, some obsessive puppet master? It's like, yeah. no, it's about our journey. Uh, Jacob's ladder, you know, you got to mm -hmm. climb all 12 steps. You mm -hmm. also, I, I had to look this up real quick. You're talking about how you sort of need the bad guy. You need the drama to continue. Um, yeah. Do you ever get into Robert Anton Wilson? Oh, God, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, here's one of my favorites from I him. met him. I met him when I was making a movie called Operation OMC, uh, which oh, was, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I co-wrote, co-directed, and starred in that. And it took us a year to shoot. We averaged one weekend a month, you know? And the reason I got a tattoo of the logo huh. was because we were in, in the middle of filming. I was actually filming uh, uh, the movie I started in Waiting in Philadelphia. Right. And I got that tattoo to make sure I would finish OMC. Uh, but OMC was our, our attempt at taking uh, what was at the time every known conspiracy theory, which a lot of them come off as comical, let's be honest, yeah. uh, and put them in one movie. So this whole movie, I call it a, uh, an action stunt comedy. Like, I think in every scene, there's definitely references to or the scenes built around conspiracy theories that we, we would read in the disinfo books and so forth. And again, this is all pre-internet, right? Right. Um, and then every, pretty much every scene, there's a stunt in it, you know, where I'm just showing off. I get hit by cars, I jump off buildings. Uh, but it took us a year to shoot and we, you know, we'd be going to Sundance, uh, myself and Gotti Harrell, a co-director co and friend of mine, we'd be going to Sundance for another movie we were involved with, but we'd be, you know, getting into Masonic halls and stuff like, you know, in Arkansas on the way there and some footage of that ended up into the movie. So we went to, I think it was called DisinfoCon at the time yeah. in, in, uh, in New York at one of the old hotels, uh, on the West side, like almost, um, it was a, it's, it's, COVID brain, um, you know, mid city, it was like 34th street. It's a famous old hotel and we're in there and we're, you know, we don't have the money to get in, but we definitely wanted like, we, you know, I, I was always kind of recording people without them knowing it. And we were just going to kind of crash. Right. Uh, and here I am trying to talk us into, you know, and it's, it's really packed and it's, I think it was like, you know, $140 at the time. We're talking like 1998 or something to get in. And it's just not working. My charm's not working. And then all of a sudden, a uh, gentleman who's very, very well known uh, in New York, uh, Anthony Hayden Guest. He's a writer, New Yorker, and it's just like from a, a very famous, like, I don't know, let me check out his Wikipedia. He's uh, Christopher Guest's brother, but he's, he's more of like, like this intellectual writer uh, type. And he comes like waltzing through all alone. And we, I had known him through trauma because he appeared in the trauma movie. And like we killed him for a quick cameo and he appeared in omc and we had shot him like a few months before and i was like anthony and he's like oh hello will and i'm like oh and we just became part of his entourage and got in and in the back you know the green room and there's you know genesis pr ridge and there's all these you know uh Grant morrison yeah underground like all these you know uh, people and I was just, you know, I didn't know who a lot of the people were. And the vibe was really weird. I'm going to tell you right now, the vibe was weird. And this is coming from Romeo, you know what <laughs> I mean? So in, in the green room, we're sitting there and, uh, and I'm like, that is, that's Robert Anton Wilson. That's him right there. And supposedly this was like right before he died. He was 80 or something. So mm -hmm. he's sitting on a couch and, and you can tell it's him. It looks to be him. And the guy Metzger, I think his name is Metzger. Who, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I, you know, we had known one another through someone we had never met. So I, I meet Metzger there and I'm like, is that, is that Robert Antibus? He's like, yeah. And he introduces us. So I get to sit at the, at his feet, you know, actually next to him on the couch for a good hour. Uh, I think he had already done his talk. I had missed that. So we recorded it, uh, the talk and I got to ask him a lot of questions and he admitted to me that right then and there sitting there, he was high on LSD. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had kind of the reverse. Uh, I had Richard Metzger come to a show. I was doing the door at um, one of the Unitarian Universalist churches, actually in Koreatown here wow. in LA. And that church wound up being on my radar as well because they were one of a few different congregations that actually sued the NSA 
when it came out that they were monitoring, you know, basically surveilling. And, and you know, there's a lot of history of going yeah. after, especially more oh, yeah. left-leaning churches. But they were like, yeah. hey, yeah, if people are feeling intimidated just from, like, coming to church, that's violating the First Amendment because you've got yeah. the right to assembly and the right yeah. to religion. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Richard Metzger showed up and his... I think his, uh, one of his friends that he came with, they didn't have a ticket, but I knew that a lot, it was uh, Chelsea Wolf was the performer. And mm -hmm. I knew that a lot of people, because I had the clickers, I was working the door. I knew a lot right. of people had already left for the night because mm -hmm. they were there for the opening act. So right. I talked to the box office manager. I'm like, hey, I know these guys. Um, I knew Richard Metzger actually, because <laughs> I think we went to the same uh, cannabis dispensary for a while. And uh -huh. so it was like the dispensary co-owner and his guest and then Metzger and his friend. And they, they were just like, hey, you know, two of us actually have tickets, but two of us still need them. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, that's fine. I'll get you in. And then all of a sudden, one of the friends um, who I had never met before, she came up to me. She's like, you know, John Cusack is right around the corner. He really wants to come in tonight, but he doesn't have a ticket either. Do you think you could do for <laughs> us? or do for him what you just did for us. And, you know, I'm so used wow. to name dropping in LA. So I just wow. figured like, oh yeah, I guess Mickey Mouse is gonna be here too. No problem. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. I didn't actually say that, but I was just like, yeah, you know, no problem, send yeah. him over. And sure enough, just a couple minutes later, this towering, I mean, I'm 5'11", but still, this guy was towering over me. Right. After that yeah. Chicago drawl, he's got all black, he's got a black baseball cap and a hoodie over the cap, total yeah. low profile. But he's just like, hey, I'm looking for Colin. I was like, hey, <laughs> come on <laughs> in. But here's the Wilson quote. Uh, uh, Bob said that when the rose and the cross are united, the alchemical marriage is complete and the drama ends. Hmm. Then we wake from history and enter eternity. Hmm. Very nice. Depending on yeah, we the tradition of rose and cross. Yeah, yeah. And keep the play going. Yeah. So, of course, we're always going to have a new bad guy or something. But yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing, like, you know, they say it brings it up in a, uh, to go back to something we said, but also I think kind of tracks what you're saying here. Um, you know, for the, the same reason that they have gargoyles and old temples to quote unquote, scare away the unworthy, right? People get offended by that. It's like, well, who's unworthy? Well, if you're going to be scared by that and you're not just thinking about, you know, communing with, you know, your higher self, spirit, God, whatever you want to call it. Uh, then you're not ready because, you know, the true, you know, whether it's, it's, you know, universal laws, which reincarnation may be one and so forth. If, if these, you know, secrets are in the wrong hands, they can be used for ill. Well, it's, yeah, it's there to sort of deter people. Um, yeah. Like, you know, cause it can be overwhelming. You don't want that magic falling in the wrong hands. Yeah. There was a Simpsons where they were visiting. Oh, oh. yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Well, I want to hear your Simpsons thing, but well, you know, it was a, definitely a later one. They were on like a European vacation, and it was one of those old Gothic, you know, cathedrals. And Homer's looking at all these frightening gargoyles, and he's like, "Wow, this is back when religion still knew how to scare the hell out of people." Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's the same thing with conspiracy theories or like, you know, I mean, look at QAnon now, the, the deep state, right? You know, and, and I think, you know, Hollywood and the entertainment industry has a lot to do with this because all these movies about like, you know, the nefarious CIA agents and, and all that stuff. So like really, uh, you know, it was ripe. Uh, it it kind of made people ripe for not believing in our institutions and thinking that all the politicians are killing babies and, you know, for their adrenochrome, like all that kind of crap. But, um, you know, when you are, Yogananda said this too, when you are somewhat desirous to know God, he sends you books and teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are very desirous of God, it's like the only thing, you know what I mean? Like if you make it your only thing, then he'll send you a true guru. Now a true guru teacher is someone who is enlightened, who can, you know, either through transference or put you through you know, the exercises, you know, someone like Jesus, you know, say what you will, but there's a missing 18 years, you know, and I, I actually, I, for, you know, it's still projects still going on. I work, one of the, my main projects uh, that I was a development producer on was about the missing years of Jesus's life from age three through, uh, I'm sorry, age, yeah, three through 33. Right. No, I'm sorry. Was it Yeah, eight through 33?
See, that's how long it's been. And I hired these uh, these scholars, you know, they're these texts, you know, that people have seen and transcribed in Tibet about this young Jewish man who takes the old Silk Road, just like Daniel did before him. That's why there's that's why there's a Jewish tribe in Kashmir, and he took the old Silk Road to go learn with the the Bodhis, you know, and then he then he enlightened himself through the techniques, the Buddhist meditation techniques, and just like every you know hero's journey, go goes back to his people to bring the boons and they kill him for it you know so it was, it was a script uh still and it was it was optioned by a big um big production company in hollywood years and years ago and then you know got stuck in development hell essentially like i've had a few projects that you know on the cover of variety this is getting made and then it attracts everyone and all and like you know if, if you don't have the final signing power a lot of cooks in the kitchen and then you end up spending millions of dollars and uh and now that you have no you know the, the chain of title isn't clean and you know and you can't get it financed anymore uh, that was one that was one of them but oddly enough it, it just kind of came back uh that particular project okay yeah, yeah some, people, some people got in touch and they want to take it out again they think it's uh, you know a good time and it and like you're saying you know with kind of multi-faith interfaith and like i was saying before about you know if you study the mystical branches of each religion you can think of even zoroastrianism mm -hmm. uh, uh they all lead to the same place and they're and they're all just you know it's like in uh in india they have the masala you know spices just like they do and you know you know it's, it's just a, a different kind of cultural aspect you know, there's theories that Jesus didn't even exist, you know, I don't believe that, but, you know, they point to the fact that, you know, the Buddhist canon, there's no way, you know, it's all from him. People ascribe to him and Buddha always, he did, you can find this, he promoted his disciples to go out into the world as far as you can go and to teach, you know, uh, teach, teach what I've taught you. Uh, and he, and he told them to kind of just you know, uh, envelop it into local lore, you know? So some people think that, uh, you know, and again, I do not subscribe to this, but, you know, when you look up about Jesus, one of the reasons he's one of the most controversial figures, I believe, is because of these things, because there is no true, you know, there's the four gospels, which we're after, and like, you know, there's scholars who looked at <clears throat> the Bible, you know, Old, Old Testament and New Testament, but especially the, you know, the gospels and you can, you know, it's like when you track a Google doc now, how many changes drafts it went through, like, right. holy moly, like so much stuff, you know, I'm surprised they left in what they did because there are, you know, obvious references to certain, you know, higher spiritual techniques, uh, that Jesus taught. And there's references to reincarnation in, in the New Testament, but that's not the stuff anyone brings up. Right. Right. Um, yeah, it's fascinating how many people, and that's another reason I'm doing this show, to push back against a lot of these, just really do the general dismissiveness. I mean, especially in more left-leaning circles, a lot of people just, well, I mean, they might have had situations like you, where maybe they were really turned off by some of the dogma that they were exposed yeah. to in their upbringing. But, you know, that's like tuning through TV stations. It's going to take a while to find something that resonates with you. But when people yeah. just completely dismiss, I mean, I could understand saying, of course, you know, he may not have been the Messiah or something like that, but to act like it's all just fairy tales, I mean, you're really not paying attention. There's Roman history, you yeah. know, there's the yeah. Maccabees history, and even like, of, of course, you go back far enough, like Noah and Adam, I can see how over time, maybe some of those stories were sort of exaggerated to get an even greater truth across. Yeah. But by the time you exactly. get to the, yeah, like most- Every culture has their flood, you know, Right, story. right. Um, and, and Exodus, I mean, there are Egyptian historians that are not Jewish, but they acknowledge like, yeah, there was this foreign governor in charge mm -hmm. around that time. Yeah. So whether you think of it as a myth, um, they're yeah. all still really important stories. And I've actually been reading this physicist called Gerald Schroeder, and he's an Orthodox Jewish, uh, I think he's won some awards for his physics work, and he's kind of trying to reconcile numbers from the Torah which tends to be the biggest complaint, uh, you know, is some of the numbers and dates and stuff not adding up. Right. And he's using Einsteinian 
um, formulas to sort of make sense of them. And what he's getting at is that like, yeah, time does stretch. It's the Big Bang Theory. And it's fascinating how in the book of Genesis, you know, they talk about how it started in the heavens, then it went to the earth, then you had watery animals, then flying animals, then land animals. That is so much closer to what we actually yeah. know than a lot of the scientists who came in between, people like Aristotle who tried to give an exact day of creation. Right. But yeah, yeah, it's yeah. fascinating stuff. Mm. Yeah. I, um, yeah. So what we were saying before about, you know, especially people on the left, they kind of, you know, oh, you're religious or, oh, you're, you know, yeah. I think it, it does, I think definitely have to do, uh, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but yeah, growing up at the time I did within Catholicism, there's a lot there <laughs> that, and still that can, uh, really, really, you know, kind of make one stop believing in a God, uh, you know, and I think that's with all the major, you know, uh, especially Christian denominations, you know, also it's just like, you look at, you know, the, uh, this rise of Christian nationalism right now, mm. you know, and there, and, you know, there's some of the most, you know, uh, just the opposite of what Jesus taught. And, and, and yet they have the cross and their Twitter handle and, and say that, you know, so the, I think that they turn people off as well, but, just like Jesus said, you know, it's like, go in your closet, pray to your father. Don't let anyone know. Like it's the kingdom of God is within. And I also said, what I can do, you can do and more. Mm. Like that's the promise, right? So, you know, through, I, th I think things like meditation, you know, going out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, you know, and talking and just like, you know, we all hear our own voice in our head anyway, but just cutting everything out. You know, our senses are, are, in many ways, are what's holding us back. You know, so when you meditate, we, we you know, close the cartilage in the ears. Uh, we close our eyes and look up into our third eye. We stay still. We have certain breathing techniques, techniques that oxygenate the blood and Ooh. slow things down, slow the thoughts down. Uh, but, you know, and plenty of people try it and they just can't do it. Like, you know, they give up, right? Because... You know, especially in our culture, we've been conditioned, like we were talking about with the movies and stuff. If you're watching YouTube all day, if you're listening to something all day, if, you know, I mean, I can sometimes, you know, if I try to clear my head and I'm back in the industry now, so I'm, I'm having to deal with it again, but I can go into a, a store and I, I hear like, oh God, that 80s song. And then it's stuck in my head, right? So how do you kind of clear those things out in meditation? But I have friends who like tried it and, and being alone with their own thoughts scare them, you know? Uh, and in fact, this is, this is somewhat of a new, uh, I think study or, or, or that came out. It was like, I think it was Americans. It was, an, it was enough, a sample pool or whatever you call it. And <clears throat> what was it? People would rather be, these are adults. I think American adults would rather be electrically shocked than be left alone with their own thoughts. Wow. Right? So that's. That tells you right there. So to me, that's the Maya. That's the devil, right? The devil is like something taking you away from God could be just your favorite show, you know? But whenever it is you sit down to pray, to sit down to connect with your inner being, which is your higher self, which is the God within you, right? Uh, but there's all this stuff when you sit down to do it. There's like, oh, I got to worry about the bills. Oh, you know, you know. So did someone just text me or like whatever it is or just images from, you know, the horror movie from the other night. It's all kind of, you know, keeping us back from, from realizing it. So then it's, it's easy to then say it doesn't exist or you're afraid if it exists. And you know what, if it does, and that's the way to get there. And I can't even be left alone with my own thoughts for a few minutes. And I'd rather be, you know, electrically shocked. Then, uh, it's not going to be this incarnation. You know, you're gonna have to come back and figure it out. Well, that kind of reminds me of, um, your, a quote of yours. What did you say are the three things that God gave us that can make us oh, feel better no matter well, what? Breathing, cr laughing, and crying. You know, and each one, this is kind of, I'm sure someone else has said it. It's not something I read. It's not, but it was something obvious, you know, because there's these adages like, um, you know, take a deep breath before you, you know, go out, you know, before you go out on the stage to, of the school play. Um, you know, uh, what's the, there's an old adage about laughter being the, the, the balm or something, you know, healing, laughter is healing, you know? So, 
as a kind of a, a physical performer who, you know, we, we were doing, before I knew it was yoga, we were doing like physical exercises when I was 17 at NYU in our movement class, you know? So there are these things that just became obvious to me that like, you know, and I'll, I'll add a fourth thing, but that's, uh, but anytime things are really, 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 really bad, a lot, you know, if, oftentimes we'll keep it in. We don't remember when we were, you know, when we were little, uh, you know, just take a deep breath. You'll be all right. Da, 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 da. Um, but, you know, deep rhythmic breathing techniques, uh, scientifically it oxygenates the blood. It slows things down. So it makes things more clear so that you see a way out of the situation. If that's, if that's what's, you know, on your mind. Um, so breathing at any point, like you're nervous about something, you take a breath, you just, you know, like hook me up to the instruments. They have the scientific instruments now that'll tell you exactly what's going on. And it's good. It's like the same thing where, you know, you, you see someone across, you see two people across the street hugging and actually endorphins get released in your own brain, you know? It's infectious. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's there, it's within us. And we're just putting all these other things on it. Uh, I know for sure. And this is like, you know, as a straight man, like, you know, sometimes it was mainly, I guess, somewhat my mother, but going through all the, you know, the, the schmacting training I went through to get in touch with my feelings, you know, uh, so I'm somewhat, you know, I guess that raised my emotional, my EI, my emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. but I forced myself. I feel like crying, you know, if something's really like, you know, I've had some things going on, especially over the, you know, these pandemic years and, and, you know, my daughter being born where, uh, you know, really, really challenging times. And I, I let myself cry. I let myself cry it out. And immediately I, one feels better. And this is just, this is just law, you know? And then finally laughter, you know, laughter is something that like, it doesn't matter how, I mean, it could be the most horrible situation. And there's a few we could point to, you know, that people would say going on right now. Right. But for each individual person, um, forcing oneself or allowing oneself to not find the humor in something like that, but to essentially open up your heart enough to God to be like, listen, motherfucker, you know, how dare you? Jeez, you know, you know what I mean? Like you have an argument or something and you'll find yourself at one point, it's going to, something's going to tickle your funny bone. And that too, immediately, immediately. Uh, and I've, I've asked, you know, other people have read that quote to me and like, oh my God, yeah, you know. Uh, I, and I'll put it up against, you know, some institutions funding of a study. Like I dare anyone to find, and it's a scientific thing because you can tell what's going on with your body when you're doing those things. You can tell what's going on with your body when you're depressed, you know, uh, brain scans and so forth. You know, it's like what they say, uh, no, what they say, that study that was done with, uh, the Dalai Lama's, they took 30 monks who had been meditating for over 10 years. Right. This is right when a few years after they came out with the, the latest of the brain scan things, you know, they put them on there and they could see what's going on. Uh, so 30 monks, all of which have been meditating for over 10 years. And you know what they found out on average that there, I think it was 70% more gray matter in their brain than the person who does not meditate. Now we can't like, you know, we can't even conceive of what that feels like, what it could be like to have that much more gray matter in your brain. But these monks, you know, he, 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 you know, so it's, uh, I think, you know, same thing. Every, every sacred text has some version of everything we've been talking about. You know, it's like in, in the Western Bible, it's, you know, uh, pass, passeth all understanding. Like you can't, you know, we, human language is not enough. Even the intellect is not enough, you know. And I think one of the things that, you know, because there have been plenty of charlatans, people who, you know, you're going on to say, change yourself first, and then thousands will be changed just by you changing yourself first. Some people get a little bit of this stuff and they're like, oh my God, we got to take it. You know, they become proselytizing people mm -hmm. who haven't totally realized it themselves. And it can be, can be very dangerous to themselves and others. So that's one of the reasons why people are like, oh, another shards and we don't know who to believe, you know, all that kind of stuff, because it, it is a personal kind of experience. And if you find 
you know, a religion, uh, even if it's like kind of a sect or a certain, uh, you know, saints, saints words and books like, like I found with Yogananda and you, or Jesus, you know, if you just practice Jesus's teachings, you know, and if I think just practicing them, the, the kind of the, uh, you know, the interior, what do they say, exoterior and then, uh, the occidental and then the esoteric. So the esoteric stuff, uh, will just kind of grow within you, mm -hmm. you know, so that when he's, you know, when he said, you know, the light of the body is the eye, therefore, if then I, like all these things can start to like true wisdom starts to come about, you know, but I can say that to someone who, you know, if I try to turn someone on to that, then, you know, I'm doing more harm than good because they're not going to react to it, uh, in the way I would want them to. And there, there, therein lies one of my mistakes. I'm trying to show someone, you know, what it is to be God, like godlike or whatever, you know. And I, I believe that too. People also, you know, we've seen so many people fall from grace, you know. And in fact, every day on my, I don't know why it's in my Twitter feed, but every day, there's two pastors in America who are being locked up for horrible, horrible crimes, sex crimes, and so forth, you know. So there's so many hypocrites, you know. So people are turned off by it. But it's not that anyone becomes God. It's that <clears throat> we all, you know, we have this free will to either deny our true nature, you know, or, or accept it. You know, do you want the giver of life or the gifts, right? Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence. Right. And yeah, keep up all of the amazing work. This is really fascinating. All right, stay in touch. Okay, definitely. You too. God bless. Peace.